So once your paper has been read and thought to be suitable, the next thing will be that the editor or peer reviewer will turn to figures and tables because they want to verify what you have said in the abstract is in fact repeated or shown by by uh, by data in the figures and tables. So pay attention to detail in figures and tables. Figure and table also need to be standalone like the abstract. So here is the figure. You can see that not only is this giving data, but it's also giving evidence sources with a reference. It's also giving an explanation of what the symbols mean. Not just saying, please read the, read the methods. Here is a slide which shows that actually figures are more accurately and more quickly read by readers. So try and get figures in instead of tables. And here is advice on how figures should be prepared. So caption need to be detailed. The key thing are define all the data, um, define every unit. The reader should not have to turn to methods or text in order to understand the graph. And these figures and graphs, I would suggest also avoid three dimensional graphs because they tend to be a little confusing. Here is an example of a figure which is more or less showing you data that could be easily presented in tables with numbers and percentages. But here it's possible to show all that information by putting the number inside the bar chart. And this way you can demonstrate also to the editor that you are making an effort more than a standard author. The idea here is to convince the editor and the more you can show them that you're making an effort, more effort than an average author, then the greater is the chance that you will be accepted. So I'd like to now just move to the next section, which is about uh, which is about discussion. But before that, if there are any questions on figures and tables, let's address them. And if there aren't any, then no worries. <clears throat> One of the questions I'm frequently asked is, how should I select a journal? So here I have some tips for that. You need to think about what is your objective. So if your audience is uh, people related to your desired place of residency in the future, and you want them to read your paper ahead of applying for the residency, then select a journal that people in those places actually read. Try to target that journal. And that way you have a better chance that uh, they will get to know you even before you turn up at their door with your residency application. So this I think is an important feature to consider who is your target audience once your paper is accepted. And that target audience after acceptance is uh, usually related to some professional objective. Uh, so work according to your professional objectives in selecting the journal. Okay, we move now to discussion. Uh, before that, you will need to write methods and results. But for methods and results, the only thing I can say is that each method and each result for each study is unique. So it's almost impossible to give any general advice about what should be in there. 
other than whatever is there should address your question. It should let the editor know that you present the findings as directed by your question. So I take you an example of a paper which I submitted many years ago, 2006, is when it was published, it was submitted in September 2005. It was immediately rejected because it did not follow the instructions of the journal. It was resubmitted after rejection and then sent out for peer review. On resubmission the, uh, and peer review, it could be that it will be, be recommended for rejection or there may be a split decision between the peer reviewers. So some might say accept and others might say reject. And this decision will be driven by knowledge of how good your study is. And this type of an assessment is made by looking at these items in the checklist that I recommended to you that you should consider uh, when you prepare your manuscript. So coming to the discussion, <clears throat> the key thing about discussion is that it should also be structured like the abstract. So using the guidance given in this published paper, we can think of four subheadings. Main findings, strengths, weaknesses, comparison, mean, meanings of findings and conclusion. So the main findings will come from the results reported in the abstract. So here is an example. Here are the results in the abstract. And the same results are reported here in the main findings of the published paper, but they are without any numbers. So this conversion is simple. You take 68% from abstract and call it two thirds. So the change is more or less straightforward. It follows naturally. How to convert numbers into words is the trick. The next thing is conclusion. This comes from the conclusion of the abstract also. So here is the conclusion written in the abstract and the text is almost identical. You can just add a few more lines after repeating the same line that was in the conclusion of the abstract. The introduction you had referred to some studies, some previous studies, you can use those studies again but this time you compare your results with the results of those studies. In the introduction, you were only commenting on their methods, not on their results, because you were highlighting their weaknesses. Here you have a chance in discussion to compare your findings with their findings. In the second paragraph called strengths and weaknesses, you need to explain how strong your methods are. So I'll give you an example. If you need to say that your study has some limitation, please give it with a positive ending. So don't just say this is a limitation of my study. They also say what you did about this limitation. So here is another example. <clears throat> you convert these negative words into positive words. So here you are explaining that there is a limitation, but I have done something about it. This then leads us to the last section, which is meanings of the findings. And in the meaning of the findings, you've got to explain 
how this information is helpful for the patients. Also, you can say something about how this information can be useful to guide future research. So here are the five uh, paragraphs of discussion. So with this, I think I will bring my presentation to close <clears throat> because I think the issue of dealing with peer reviewers is uh, possibly for another day. Uh, we'll stay here and <clears throat> take your questions. Um, we have a question in the chat box. Um, okay. Yeah, so someone asked if it's a good idea to add subheadings to the discussion and the results and also to the methods. <clears throat> Let's see what is the exact wording. Uh, uh, the question is. Yes, definitely. All three sections should have subheadings. It makes it, it makes reading very much easier. So, also I would give a couple of other pieces of advice uh, concerning the write-up. Please always introduce an extra space, extra line, extra empty line between paragraphs. It makes it easier to read. Subheadings serve the same purpose. It makes it easier to read. The subheadings in addition give a logical order to the information. So yes, please do use subheadings in methods, in results, and in discussion, all three. In introduction, usually subheadings are not used or not permitted, uh, but that is okay. Introduction is usually a very short section, no more than one to one and a half page with only three paragraphs. Um...